so now, how about we also derive the equation of motion for a case where we have a varying acceleration? Um, realistically, in real world, acceleration may not necessarily be constant, right? So we, a car, if you're moving a car, if you're driving a car, acceleration may actually follow a function. Um, here, let's assume acceleration is a linear function of time that looks like this, just for a simplicity. And then we had this uh, equation of motion from before where speed is equal to the integration of the acceleration plus the initial speed of the vehicle. Now, if I replace, if I rewrite this as t0 to t1, and instead of this acceleration function, I put this y minus zt dt plus the initial speed of the vehicle. And if I take this integration with this specific acceleration function, I can get an equation relates, that relates the speed um, to, that relates the speed to this acceleration function as follows. So if you just take the integration of this one, this is this is what you get. It's an easy integration to take. So so you'll get to this equation. And then in and if and if we also use this, uh, and if we also use the other motion equation for the location, which was what? Which was from t0 to t1 vt dt plus x t0. And if I now replace this. And if I replace this VT function here with this equation that we just derived, and if I just put this here, and if I take the integration, that would be a, like a larger integration to take, but it's still easy. You'll get to this function, which has a power three in it. Um, and that is because look, I have a power three in it. That's because the acceleration is changing. Remember I talked about jerk, and that is the third derivation of location with respect to time. So in all the previous examples we had, when acceleration is constant, that means we don't have any jerk. But here, acceleration is not constant. So what would be just jerk here? Jerk is dA over dt, right? Uh, how, how acceleration changes. So in this case, jerk is equal to minus z. So, and we want in reality, we want this z to be small, either positive or negative, doesn't matter. It depends whether the car is accelerating or decelerating, but uh, we want that z to be small. Uh, we don't want a high jerk because that feels uh, uncomfortable for the passengers. But anyways, this is how, an example of how we can actually derive the motion of equation for varying acceleration case. Previously, we did it for the constant acceleration. We did it for constant speed, or in other words, acceleration equal to zero. And um, this is now like a more uh, realistic case. Now let's get to a practical example. That's where I want you to engage a little bit more with me. Um, so imagine a vehicle approaches a traffic signal at a speed of 70 kilometer per hour. Then the vehicle is 30 meter away from the approach stop bar. The signal indication turns yellow for two seconds and then it turns to red. Assume that the driver's reaction time is one second and the vehicle's deceleration function is um, as acceleration function is equal to minus 12 minus 1.5 T. So the problem is asking us if the driver decides to apply the brakes, will the vehicle be able to stop safely at the signal? The second question is asking if the driver decides to proceed through the intersection at the vehicle's initial speed of 70 km per hour, how long will it take for the vehicle to clear the signal? Will it be able to cross without running the red light? And the last part of the question is asking, let's recalculate part A, now assuming that the vehicle's deceleration is constant and equal to minus five meter per square second. What are the effects of this assumption on the estimated stopping distance? So let's go back to the problem. Uh, let's try to visualize it a little bit before we tackle the problem. So we have a traffic signal here. 
and there is a vehicle moving towards this traffic signal. And this is the stop bar. You, stop bar is that white line that you, that vehicles have to stop behind it when the signal turns red. So that's the stop bar. And the vehicle is 30 meter away from the stop bar. So when the vehicle is 30 meter from the stop bar, so let's say, this is 30 meter. As soon as the vehicle gets to this 30 meter distance, the signal turns yellow. So yellow time would be two seconds. And then after two seconds, it goes to red. If the vehicle's, if the driver's reaction time is one second and the vehicle's deceleration function is this, let's calculate what the problem is asking us. So we wanna know in the first question, we wanna know if the driver decides to apply the brakes, will the vehicle be able to stop safely at the signal? So in this case, I wanna know if the driver here decides to push the brake, does it have enough space and time to stop before the stop bar? Uh, so let's let's calculate things here. So how can I how can I start? So we can start with the of course we can obviously we start with the motion equation. Let's first obtain the speed function that corresponds to the acceleration function that is given in the problem. So if you start with the, the speed function which says speed is equal to the integration of acceleration plus the initial speed of the vehicle. And the problem has given us the acceleration function as below. So minus 12 minus 1.5 T. So this is the acceleration function. We replace this into this integral. And then if you take that integral, we'll end up with equation like this that relates speed and time given that uh, acceleration uh, function that we have. So this is the speed function of the vehicle. So remember, we said this is the signal, this is the stop bar, this is the vehicle. So the speed function of the vehicle is this. And the driver tries to the driver decides to push the brake, right? Um, I want to know how long it takes for the vehicle to stop. What should I do? I have the I have the speed equation here. When the vehicle is stopped, what does it mean? It means the speed is equal to zero, right? So this the, this the vehicle is here. We need to make sure the vehicle uh, the vehicle is going to stop. But the question is how long it takes for the vehicle to stop given this um, speed equation that we have. That means I have to make Vt equal to zero, right? Because let's say after some time, when the vehicle is stopped, V is equal to zero, right? So that means if I take this equation of motion and make it equal to zero, and if I find the time that makes it happen, And that is equivalent to taking the root of this equation, right? So if we solve this equation for Vt is equal to zero to determine how much time it would take for the vehicle to stop given the provided acceleration function. If we take the root of this function, if you, if you do the calculation and take the root, the, the, this is because this is a polynomial function, it's a power two function, right? It obviously has two roots, if you remember from the math. Uh, and if you find the roots, I'm going to show you how to find the roots. It's easy. You can either do it by hand as you knew it or do it through MATLAB. Um, we'll find two roots for it. One is minus 17 seconds, which doesn't make sense. Negative time doesn't mean anything. So this is out. This is an unacceptable uh, solution. And the other one is 1.4829 seconds. And that is an acceptable one because it's a positive time. That makes sense. Uh, so that means it takes 1.48 seconds for the vehicle to stop. 
but is that is that the answer we want? Um, I mean, before before I continue with that, let me first show you how to do it in MATLAB to find a root in MATLAB. This is again another easy um, uh, coding practice in MATLAB if you haven't um, done that much before. Um, if I go back to my MATLAB and let me get rid of this function that we plotted before, and if I come here, if I type clear and CLC, it clears everything. Now let's define a function. I want to find the root of that uh, speed function that we what that we derived. So I say uh, function equal to at sign x. That means I'm I'm specifying what is the variable of, in my function. So I'm defining my function as f(x) function of x, right? And then I say my function, which is a function of x, is actually equal to 17 minus 12 power x minus 1.5 power. This is the equation function that we derived, right? So remember to put the parentheses correctly. So we do the mathematical functions in order, the mathematical transactions in order. So divided by two. So that's the uh, that's the that's the speed equation that we derive, right? So this is now my uh, function, and now I need to specify an initial point or guess for sorry uh, for my um, for the root that I want to find. I want to find the root of this equation, but um, I can try with x zero equal to zero as my um, initial guess of the solution, of the root of this equation. And then if I say f0, so this is the function. This f0 is the function that you need to use to find the root in MATLAB, x0. And let's see what it finds. There you go. It, find, it finds uh, 4.5433. Um, is that? Oh, this is a different acceleration. This is a different, is this a different speed equation that we use? Yes, sorry. I mean, I'm using a different, I, I was asking my question, I was asking a question why the root is different than what we had in the previous slide, but I'm using a different um, equation. But let's 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 use our own equation here. So let me change. So this is the root that we, we, were, we were interested in for this specific function. But if I want to use um, our own equation, so let me, rewrite this again. So let me rewrite the equation as we like it. So the function is actually minus 12 power a, sorry, multiply by x minus um, 1.5 multiply x power 2. So let's do divided by 2 here. Uh, plus 70. 70 what? It was 70 kilometer per hour, right? And the acceleration function that we had was in seconds. So we need to actually convert this 70 kilometer per hour to uh, meter per seconds to be able to uh, make sure the units are um, compatible or consistent with each other. So let's do 70 multiply by 1,000 divided by 3600 0, 0, to convert the units from kilometer per hour to meter per second, I believe. So that is my, oops, there's something wrong. Um, yes, I have a silly mistake here. I have multiply divided, so that would be 1.5 divided by 2. Yep, this is correct now. So that is my function. And now if I want to find the root, what should I do in MATLAB? I just need to say I give it an initial solution. It's, I, 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 that's my guess that root is equal to zero, but then it starts from zero and finds the actual root. So now to find the root, I say f0 function x0, and let's see. The root, there you go. We found the correct root, 1.4829. And that is the same as the root that I had here in my previous slide. So that's the 
that's the time it takes for the vehicle to stop. But is that the is that the time that we? Um, but we need to convert that to time. Sorry, we need to convert that to distance, right? Because we want to know whether we have enough uh, space for the vehicle to stop before the stop bar. So it takes uh, 1.48 seconds. And now, if we want to convert that to to to, to, to space, we need to uh, let me make this full screen. Um, we can use another equation motion with the location this time. Instead of connecting V and A, now we're going to relate a location and uh, a speed. So we had this equation motion before. I have my equation, I have my uh, speed equation now, which is equal to minus 12t minus 1 point t power 2, 2 plus vt0, right? We got this from the previous slides. And then if I replace this here and take the integral, I get to this uh, uh, motion equation. And then um, remember this VT was 70 kilometer per hour. So we need to convert it into meter per second. Uh, and then if I, and that T, that we got, so I want to convert this t to location, to, to distance, right? So t was 1.4829, 1.4829. So the vehicle takes 1.4829 seconds to stop, but how long in terms of distance that is? Uh, so if I put t into the equation of the distance that I derived here, and if I do the calculation, I leave it to you, it's an easy just putting some numbers into equations, I get to this 14.8250 meter, okay? But is that really the only location we have to look? So look, if I go back to the problem, so it takes 14, what is it, 14 meter? 14 something meter, 14.8 meter. It takes 14.8 meter to, for the vehicle to stop. But we're missing another piece here, and that is the reaction time. From the time that the driver decides to push the brake, it takes one second. It takes, from the time I make the decision, it takes one second to I, till the, I really push the brake, okay? So for that one second of time, the vehicle is still continues with that constant speed that it was going. So we also have to calculate the distance that the vehicle is moving within that reaction time period. Then plus that 14 meter, that we calculated, then we'll see whether the vehicle can stop before the stop bar or not. So let's do that calculation. Uh, as I said, 14.8 is the distance traveled after the vehicle starts decelerating. We also need to account for the distance the vehicle will travel during the driver's reaction time period before we apply the brake. So for that one second period, that is the reaction time duration, the vehicle is going with constant speed. And the speed of the vehicle was 70 kilometer per hour. We convert it to meter per second. And the time is one second. That is the reaction time. And if you do the calculation, you'll get to 19.4 meter of distance traveled. Now, if we want to really know with how long it takes for the vehicle to stop in terms of the distance, we need to uh, sum these two up. So this is the time that it takes for the vehicle to decelerate and stop. This is the time that it takes uh, that is related to the reaction time period of the driver. And if you sum these two up, we get to 34.2 meter before stopping the vehicle. What does that mean? If I go back to the problem, we only had 30 meter from the stop bar. So that means the actually the vehicle will stop somewhere here, right? That is, four point something meter away from the stop bar. So in this case, this means unfortunately the vehicle will not be able to stop safely and the driver must react much earlier. So this vehicle in this case will not gonna stop before the stop bar. If I continue to, I mean, there, um, I, I, have a, I have a computer lab activity here that I want you to plot the profile of the acceleration of speed over time and plot the 
vehicle trajectory in a time space diagram as we derived here, but I leave it to you. This is a practice for you uh, for MATLAB. Um, if we move to the second part of the problem, the problem is now asking, um, will the vehicle safely pass the yellow time or not? Uh, so if I come back to the question, so it says, if the driver, for the second part of the problem, it says if the driver decides to proceed through the intersection, so if I do not, if the driver does not decelerate, you know it happens, it happens all the time that you hit the red, you hit the yellow light, and you have to make a decision: can I, should I push the brake and stop before it turns red, or can I just keep going? and I have enough time. And sometimes you think, oh yeah, I'm close enough, I can pass the yellow time. Sometimes you say, oh no, no, I'm far away, I'd better push the brake and stop. Um, so in this case, the question is asking us if the driver decides to proceed through the intersection at the initial speed of 70 km per hour, how long will it take uh, for the vehicle to clear the signal? Will it be able to cross without running the red light? So. In this part, we're going to check whether the vehicle is actually will be actually running the red light if if the driver decides not to push the brake. So, in this case, the vehicle travels through the intersection without decelerating. So, what does that mean? That means uh, it's going with a constant speed of 70 kilometer. So, I use the equation motion for the constant uh, speed with acceleration zero. So again, I convert 70 kilometer to second per meter. And what should I use for time here? Uh, we have a yellow interval of two seconds. So I want to know how long the vehicle uh, can drive during that two seconds time interval when, when the signal is yellow. So I use two seconds here, multiply by the constant speed of the vehicle. It gives me 38 meter. What does it mean? 38 meter, the vehicle was here. This is the stop bar. This was the signal. The initial location was 30 meter away. If the vehicle does not decelerate and continues with its constant speed, after two seconds, the vehicle will actually be somewhere here. Eight meters away from the 8.88 meters away from the stop bar. So it's gonna be 38 meters total. So that means, luckily, the vehicle can safely pass the yellow time without running the red light, uh, which is good news, right? Uh, better than decelerating in this case. Now let's have a look at the third part of the problem. The third part of the problem was saying, recalculate the first part, assuming the deceleration function is different. This time we are saying the deceleration is constant with minus five meter per square meter. We want to see if, if, if the vehicle decelerates harder, would that help? Because in, in the first part of the problem, if you remember, the vehicle was not able to stop before the stop bar. Now we want to see if the deceleration is harder, it's minus five meter per square meter, sorry, minus five meter per square second. Uh, is that enough? And can this help the driver to stop the vehicle before the stop bar? So if I go back to this part, and let's first calculate the, uh, the, the reaction time is the same, right? So the reaction time of the driver is the same as one second. So let's first calculate the, we already calculated this, but let's do it again. Uh, let's calculate the distance that it takes for the driver uh, uh, let's calculate the distance that the vehicle moves during that during that reaction time period. So I have 70 kilometer per hour converted to meter per second, multiplied by one second of the reaction time. So that's the reaction time. So it's 19.44 meter. That's the distance traveled during the reaction time. And now, remember the equation of motion for the constant acceleration that we derived. So if we just use that. So I want to know what would be the speed of the vehicle. Uh, actually, I don't want to know the speed of the vehicle. I want to know how long it takes. But I use the speed equation. 
and I need to take the root of that equation. So uh, it's 70 multiply 1,000 over 6300. That's to convert kilometer per hour to meter per second minus 5t. That's my constant acceleration, and that's t, right? So if I make this equal to zero, that gives me the time that it takes for the vehicle to stop, and that is 3.88 seconds, okay? But I need to convert this to meter, right? So this is the time that it takes for the vehicle to stop with that new acceleration function or with that new uh, constant acceleration. I want to know how long, how long in terms of a space it takes for the vehicle to stop. So if I use the other motion equation where I, 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 where I can calculate the location of the vehicle given that constant acceleration, again, we derived this equation previously in the previous slides, right? And now if I put the equations into it, uh, if, sorry, if I, put the, if I put the numbers into it, um, how long it takes in terms of the distance uh, to stop, uh, this is, I mean, I can say this is zero. I have the initial speed, it's 70 kilometer per hour. This delta T is 3.888 seconds. This is the time in terms of, this is the time that it takes. So 3.8 seconds. And then I have acceleration is minus five and uh, T zero is zero. And I have this T power two, which is 3.88 power two. So if I put all the numbers into the equation and then you calculate the distance that the vehicle travels, it's 37.8. So, and then if I sum this 37.8 plus the 19 meter that I calculated in relation to the reaction time, it gives me 57 meter. This is actually larger than the previously calculated distance in part A, right? So, that means that deceleration, that deceleration, that constant deceleration function is also not enough um, for the vehicle to stop. Uh, so the vehicle will not be able to safely pass the yellow time. Uh, sorry, the vehicle will not be um, able to uh, stop. Uh, so for example, behind the stop bar. So if, if this was the stop bar, this was the vehicle. This was initially 30 meter, right? So this was the signal. And the, the, the new distance that the vehicle needs to stop is actually 57. That means the vehicle moves through the stop bar and stops somewhere here. Uh, so the vehicle cannot stop before the stop bar. Um, And if you look at the deceleration function, I think the problem here is the deceleration is still low. We need a much a harder deceleration to be able to stop if you want to. Or in other words, the vehicle is very close to the stop bar. So it's better for the vehicle not to push the brake. Instead, as we calculated in uh, second part of the problem, it's better for the vehicle to continue with its constant speed and pass the yellow time and the vehicle will not be running the red light. So hopefully this example gives you a nice overview of how these motion equations can be used in practice to calculate uh, or predict the location of vehicle at different times and in different uh, situations where we have constant speed, where we have constant acceleration, or where we have an acceleration function. Um, Next, um, I'd like to move to the relationship between vehicle trajectories and traffic performance. So when the trajectory of a vehicle is known, we can actually obtain a range of possible performance measures. So I would say vehicle trajectory data is a very rich data set. It is the foundation of traffic flow theory. You can, you can calculate so many things from trajectory. You can calculate instantaneous speed. You can calculate average speed. You can calculate acceleration. You can calculate delays. You can look at the distribution of a speed over some time, calculate the standard deviation of a speed, calculate the standard deviation of acceleration. You can calculate jerk. You can calculate so many different things. So the vehicle trajectory data 
I would say is the richest data set that we can have when it comes to traffic analysis. But it's expensive to collect. Either the vehicle has to, has to have a GPS or we have to have a camera, uh, for example, viewing the road so we can collect the images and then convert those images to vehicle trajectories. Um, with the increasing penetration of mobile phones, it's easier. Um, so for example, companies like Google or TomTom Tom, um, follow your mobile phones uh, or the GPS in the, in the vehicle and they use that information to calculate the average speed. So you see how on Google Maps you see the Google traffic. You see you see how how Google Maps shows you the traffic, this the speed levels. It shows you re green, red. Where do they get that data? That data comes from the mobile phones that have GPS on it. Plus, if some vehicle has some GPS inside it, they can also they may also have access to that data. So they combine all that data together to calculate the average speed of every single street over time. Um, so they convert, they plot all those trajectories, they calculate the average speed, and then they use it, they show it on, on that, uh, on that Google, Google Maps. Um, another interesting aspect is uh, the vehicle characteristics actually affects uh, how trajectories will look like. So the, the size of a vehicle, the weight of a vehicle, they all matter. So a small vehicles versus a large truck. Um, it affects the performance of the vehicle. It affects how the trajectory will look like because I'm sure you've all have seen that, for example, large trucks cannot have as high acceleration as a small vehicle or even uh, compared to motorcycles. Motorcycles can have very high acceleration, right? So the, the curvature is very um, highly accelerating in terms of in, in the trajectories of a motorcycle compared to a truck. Uh, so all of that affects how the trajectories look like. And then consequently, it affects how the traffic performs. So that means the composition of traffic really matters. If you have a lot of, if you have a lot of trucks in traffic versus if you have a lot of motorcycles in traffic versus if you have a very homogeneous car traffic, they all affect how the traffic stream will behave. So here I have a table. Um, again, the units are in the US system, but for example, the passenger car, the, the length of a passenger car is usually 14 feet. Uh, you can see trucks, that the length of trucks increases, uh, bus is 14 feet. And then if you look at the maximum speed that they can reach, as the size of the vehicle increases, the maximum speed they can reach goes down. And if you also look at the maximum acceleration, you can see that a very large truck has a very low acceleration compared to a regular car, a regular passenger car. Um, and interestingly, look at the jerk. No matter what car you're in, a jerk relates to how, you know, if you remember, we said jerk relates to how people, the passenger in the car feels. So um, usually we, we try to keep that to maximum seven feet per a cubic second. Um, so anything larger than that, that feels very uncomfortable for the passenger. When it comes to performance of traffic, the driver characteristics also matters. Just like the example we saw where there was a reaction time in place, right? So if imagine we have a very old driver versus a very young driver. So usually as you age more, as the driver ages more, the reaction time also increases. So it takes longer for the person, if it has a larger reaction time to push the brake or to accelerate or decelerate. And as we saw, it really matters, that reaction time really matters and it really affects how long vehicles can uh, will need to stop or how long it takes for them to accelerate to reach maximum speed, for example, if they're moving. Um, so, so, so the driver characteristics, characteristics are also very important when it comes to traffic performance in addition to the vehicle characteristics itself. So some of the main driver characteristics that I could name is the attention and information processing capability of the v driver, vision of the driver. That's why the vision is important. In, and when you get your driver license, uh, they really care about the vision. Perception reaction time, and also the speed choice. Some drivers are timid, some drivers are aggressive. So 
it, it really affects what a speed or what kind of acceleration, deceleration behavior you will follow. Um, so here's a very schematic illustration of how things relate when it comes to traffic performance. We have perception reaction time, we have a degree of aggressiveness of drivers, we have familiar familiarity with highway facility, we have age, gender, vision capability, socio-economic socio characteristics, whether the driver is under influence of alcohol or drug, um, and they all affect how we design highways. So, for example, if you're designing a highway, you're designing a signal uh, for a community that's the average age is 60, <laughs> year old versus a community that the average age is, let's say, 25, it really matters how you design the road network, or it really matters how you design um, the signal timing. Um, in addition to the driver and also the vehicle characteristics, the environment that we are driving in also matters. For example, if you're driving in a, in a, in a mountainous area, versus you're driving in a flat area, uh, if you're driving on a highway versus you're driving an arterial, uh, if you're driving somewhere where, have, where you have a lot of traffic signals versus you're driving in a circle or a roundabout. So the kind of facility that you're driving also affects the way you drive. So if I wanna summarize this, uh, there are three bigger kind of umbrella factors that affects um, traffic. That is the environment that we drive in, uh, driver characteristics, and also the vehicle characteristics. Um, and, and when it comes, and, and also the interaction of the vehicles among themselves. So if you have a slow moving truck in front of you, it affects how you drive, even if you wanna go higher speed, you can't because you have a slow moving truck in front of you. So it's like a game theoretic environment where you also affect how people around you drive. Uh, so it's a very complex system, and that makes it very interesting from a science perspective. And that's what we do and what, what we try to uh, explore uh, when it, in, in traffic flow theory and traffic modeling. Um, I have a workshop problem here for you that um, I think it will, cover, it will be covered in the workshop today, or maybe a variation of this problem will be covered. But if it's, if it's already covered in the workshop, good. If it's not, just take it as a practice problem for yourself. So I leave this for you. I leave it. I leave this to you to work on. It's an additional example. Uh, I also have additional computer lab problem for you. If you want to again practice your MATLAB coding, uh, just like what I've shown you, go to MATLAB, try to plot some of the trajectories and plot the speed profiles as I showed you um, uh, with this specific example. Again, this is for you to take on and challenge yourself with if you haven't worked with MATLAB before.